I'm Claire Hubble, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we hear details of Ukraine's reported strike on a bridge in Russian-occupied Melitopol, and discuss claims Moscow is turning to decades-old ammunition with high failure rates as it burns through its stockpiles. Plus, with the year drawing to a close, many of us might find ourselves with extra time to sink our teeth into some new reading material. We hear three of The Telegraph journalists' recommendations for books that provide context, reflection and analysis on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from The Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 13th of December, day 293. And today, I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols, Assistant Comment Editor Francis Dernley, Senior Foreign Correspondent Roland Oliphant, and journalist and author Colin Freeman. I started by asking Dom for the latest updates from the front line. Well, hi, Claire, and good afternoon, everybody. So the big news from the last uh, last 24 hours is of um, a strike. Hang on, hold that verb. Um, But uh, something's happened to a a bridge in Melitopol. So this is Hezon Oblast um, to the south. This is uh, on the... On the mainland of Ukraine, north of Crimea, west of Mariupol, uh, a major city in that area and a major logistic area. It's a sort of confluence of rail and road in that area. It's a it's one of the big sort of gateways into and out of Crimea. Um, now it's come under attack in recent days. We saw the the, the very large blast there um, a few days ago, um, and overnight last night something's happened to one of the major bridges. Now th- there are no signs of a of a strike on the bridge. There's no obvious very large hole, um, but one of the one of the supporting structures and engineers. Please forgive me. I'm going to get all the all the terminology wrong. But one of the big concretey bits that hold it up. Um, there you go, nailed it, um, has has been destroyed somehow and the centre of the bridge has totally sagged. So it is still passable by foot on the image that, that you can see on social media. It is passable by foot, probably by, by light vehicle as well, um, but it looks extremely vulnerable. Anything heavy, tanks, artillery, self-propelled artillery, um, uh, engineering assets, anything of that ilk, uh, probably would come a cropper. Now, there's speculation... Um, about what what caused this, it's it is within missile range, high Mars range, just of some some areas that um, that are under Ukrainian control. But as I say, there's no obvious sign of a blast. It suggests that something has happened from underneath. Again, not not a not a massive blast, which there it, it could be partisan activity, could be special forces. We we don't know. Um, and actually, I suppose partisan activities, special forces, that's where the term comes from in the Second World War. A slight divert, sorry. Uh, so we don't know what's happened, but um, no immediate signs of, of missile damage. Um, but obviously, within the same uh, same few days as these strikes that we think have killed hundreds of, of, of Russian soldiers in Melissapol over the weekend, and the high mile strike further east on that on that uh, holiday resort turned barracks for the Wagner Group. This all suggests um, a, sh- a shaping operation as well as, I mean, it makes good military sense to try and hit these targets, but, you know, hey, there are bridges all over the place. Why, why would you choose to concentrate your force and go for a, a particular area here? Now, on this area, I, w- I would point you to Mike Martin. Um, he- we've had him on the pod a few times. Good guy, King's College. He's, uh, so he's at a threshed thought, I think he is on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, I should ask him why that is, actually. No idea. But um, a good guy. He, for a long time, he's been, as have others, he's been suggesting that that given the the hard the bank, if you like, of the Dnipro, which suggests something in Herzon is, is unlikely for, for the next Ukrainian advance, and the effort that Russia is trying to put into uh, the central Donbass, Bakhmut, and, and that area further to the uh, to the north, they're smashing their head against Bakhmut, and Ukraine are, are quite happy to let them. Well, no, that's, that's a bit glib, but yeah, you know, they are they are losing a lot of people for very very little gain, if anything, around Bakhmut and the central Donbass. So, I think Ukraine 
would look at that and say that is a an efficient use of military force from their point of view, um, holding up this Russian advance and causing huge casualties there. So Mike Martin and others, and we've we've suggested it before, uh, are um, analysing that 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 bit in the middle, so the kind of the southern axis, if if you like, south of Zaporizhia, uh, northwest of Mariupol, that area there is is ripe for uh, pressure. If Ukraine were able to push forces through there and maybe even get to the coast, th- that would split Russia's forces in two. Mike Martin is suggesting that actually this should, this would come. Um, it would be very helpful if the Kirsch Bridge was was attacked again, thereby sealing off Russian forces on Crimea so they could only be resupplied by that land bridge. And if Ukraine are able to sever that and sort of rush to the sea, um, they would be, they'd be very vulnerable. They'd have Russians on both flanks. So by no means uh, a simple task any, any day of the week. Um, but that would be a very, very effective military operational effort. Um, to do that, you need to seal off the logistics as we've seen Ukraine very very good at doing very capable at doing shaping the operation to cut off Russian logistics cut off their 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 artillery guns first and foremost but those there's other supplies there's vital supplies of fuel ammunition water to the to the vehicles and the uh, and the personnel and then move in 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 an advance so maybe what's what we're seeing around Melitopol is some form of shaping operation we've said here many times that or I've said I don't think that that winter will be will be impossible for Ukraine to mount a decent, um, sizable operational level military effort. I think Russia will have, the Russian forces will have their heads down, worried more about staying alive than actually trying to advance. So prior to the thaw in the spring, when all these these, um, mobilized troops from Russia are coming online and perhaps been integrated into into the wider military units, although that's a big ask. Um, I think Ukraine might try something else over the winter when the when the ground is hard, the vehicles can move. I mean, it's difficult to hide when there's no foliage and you know, your heat signature gives you off from miles away, but it's entirely doable to have a, a military campaign. So perhaps Melitopol is where we should be looking. We will, we will return to that, I'm sure. Um, secondly, I just point you to some news in the last couple of hours. There's a, a large base inside Russia, so about 50 k's inside Russia, 200 kilometers sort of northeast of Kiev. Um, this is uh, in Klinsky or in the Bryansk Oblast, the, the city of Klinsky, which appears to be the main base of Russia's 488th Motor Rifle Regiment. That's been hit by something. There's a very large crater there. Uh, speculation online that it was uh, an OGR-21 Toshka short-range ballistic missile, which we think has got a 500 kilogram warhead, but something's gone very, very badly wrong there for the for the russians in there uh, in a, a sort of major a barracks there um and just the final thing uh in terms of news in fact no, two two other quickies if i may so according to the institute for the study of war us-based think tank which we which we believe um, we think pretty pretty credible and also a ukrainian analysis organization the center for De- uh, defense strategies they're saying that Russia really is concentrating now in that central area around Donetsk and the, and the Kharkiv Luhansk uh, regions. They are centralizing their command and control around the Western military district. So the big sort of organizing body for, for Russian forces uh, in that area. And they're saying that um, they're assessing that sort of the 20th Combined Arms Army of the, of the Western military district is operating in the area in, in various groupings. I won't sort of get, get all wonkish and organogram, but they're suggesting that they really are centralizing the command of control there bringing under that that um under that umbrella um some units of the donetsk and Luhansk people's republics their phraseology for you know the local partisan forces that they are they're trying to raise in those areas and they suggest that there's um 15 to 17 battalions so hey let's call it 16 for cash 16 uh, 16 battalions ish in the general area although they make the point isw and the center for defense uh, strategies make the point that these troops uh, are likely severely uh, under strength and have been degraded over uh, in the recent uh, recent weeks especially and the last thing I would say is just in the last hour or so, Dmitry Peskov, the uh, Kremlin spokesman, has been speaking to reporters um, and he's saying that uh, there's going to be um, there's no progress until Kiev recognises the um, occupied areas as Russian. And he's saying that um, the suggestion from President Zelensky that Russia should to start putting his troops out before Christmas is is um, well he's he's rubbish the idea. Uh, Peskov says, "quote The Ukrainian side needs to take into account the realities that have developed on the ground. Um, these realities show that the Russian Federation has new territories." Blah 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 blah. Anyway, the point is, um, 
I think the only people that need to recognise the new reality on the ground is is Russia and the Kremlin. And I, so this is this is great messaging. It, it it doesn't necessarily fit the classic Kremlin messaging of either distract, divert, deny, or discredit. You know, they're normal means of misinformation. Because this is just this is just kind of wishful thinking. I can't think of something that begins with a D that adequately sums up wishful thinking. But but saying oh they need to recognise the the facts on the ground. It's like hmm okay well, let's have a t- let's have a talk about facts on the ground, Dimitri. It's not going to be a conversation that ends well for you. But yeah, they, they are poo pooing this idea of any kind of well firstly any any trouble and secondly any um, any suggestion of pulling their troops out this side of Christmas. I mean this is just waffle. It's just noise and word salad because I mean they don't they're not really going to get a vote. Of course, they're not going to pull their troops out. And in terms of realities on the ground, I mean, they are not shaping events at the moment. They are not influencing events. They are they are behind the curve. All they're able to do is um, is keep hitting the national infrastructure of Ukraine and you know that plan to try and drive a, a schism between the population and the political leadership just isn't working. Um, they are also pushing on the diplomatic front. That we've we've mentioned before, um, that's that's all they've really got left because the battlefield at the moment, and there will be reversals. I mean, this is a long, this is going to be a long war. There will be reversals. Russia is going to take ground undoubtedly at some point. We should be prepared for that. But right now, they are just not influencing events. So Peskov going on about these four new territories and how you know, Ukraine and President Zelensky should recognise that they are now part of Russia since they announced those ridiculous referenda. All Russia has done is move backwards in these areas. So I, I highlight this just to mark the conversation that is happening um, and that these conversations are taking place in the Kremlin and in public. Um, but, yeah, we mark and move on because it's, it's utter, utter nonsense. Thanks for that, Dom. As for you, Francis, I understand there's some significant updates regarding the G7 and America's commitments to supply weapons. What are these latest developments? Thank you, Claire, and good afternoon, everyone. Yes, let's start with the G7. So this is happening as we speak, and indeed President Zelensky was speaking, I think, about an hour ago, requesting more firepower for Ukraine, unsurprisingly. And the G7 has vowed to meet Kyiv's urgent weapons needs for the coming months. This is particularly said to be focused on air defences, but haven't got any more details quite on that yet. But it would tally with what we saw from President Biden on Sunday, who announced that that was also the priority for Washington. Washington was providing air defences, uh, which would obviously try and stall the Russian attacks uh, by Iranian drones on critical infrastructure, as well as other munitions. I believe the first sh- batch of power equipment to Ukraine was shipped there that was agreed uh, last month. I think that's just arrived. So that's um, also a positive development in that space. But the top line story, or at least the one that's caused the most commentary this morning, including from the British MOD, is that Russian President Vladimir Putin will not be holding his annual year-end marathon news conference this month because, we believe, of the war in Ukraine. Now, why is this significant? Well, it's a break in this long-held tradition that Putin has been addressing journalists, international and domestic now for the last 10 years. And so this will be the first time in a decade that he does not do so. And observers who uh, have been following this now um, very closely for all of the years that he's been doing it have said this is really unprecedented. And I was speaking to one this morning that say it really speaks to the Kremlin's uneasiness about the string of battlefield setbacks that we've seen in recent months. The British MOD, as I say, have said that this they believe is due to avoid difficult and unscripted questions being posed to the Russian leader. Now, usually it has to be said these questions are vetted in advance, but clearly they're anxious that there may be journalists who would seek to ask non-vetted questions. And because it's live, there would be concern that this could cause uh, distinct embarrassment. But the real significance of this, of course, is that it's suggestive of tensions in Russia and awkward questions around the war not being welcomed at all by the top brass and things being so severe that they don't want to risk there being further exposure of just quite how serious things may well be. As we've talked about at length in the past on this podcast, autocracies can always appear strong or have the semblance of being very strong as a consequence of them controlling the media and other things. But when things turn, they turn quickly. And I think this is them trying to avoid any cracks becoming real fissures in the edifice of how they're trying to 
sell this war to the wider public. Um, and as I say, really a lot of commentary on this this morning. So hence why I wanted to touch on that really uh, above the G7. Um, but lastly, the uh, energy front, I think it's important just to uh, flag what's going on there because it's been something I've been covering a lot recently. Ukrainian Prime Minister has said that the UN nuclear watchdog, the IAEA, has agreed to dispatch permanent teams to the country's nuclear plants, including the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia, of course, a major cause of concern due to it being a hotspot of fighting. And uh, this is a welcome development uh, because many believe that it means that there can be more stable observations of what's going on there. And just one other thing in the energy space. Uh, I spoke yeah, at the end of last week about how Turkey... There were sort of these huge backlogs of shipping and tankers there due to the price cap coming in, which was causing quite considerable concern for the markets. And not only that, but obviously hurting Russia as well, because they weren't any able to uh, sell to uh, international suppliers of their of their oil and gas. But I understand that the queue of around 20 oil ships is now being cleared uh, as, as there have been some sort of... Um, uh, discussion debate that's been concluded between uh, how these ships are being checked for proof of insurance as a consequence of these new EU measures that have come in. So things are clearing, which is a positive sign for uh, for the Russians probably, but also for, for broader energy markets, it has to be said as well, given the tangled complexities of this issue. And um, I should also probably mention as well the fact that as part of this announcement from the Kremlin that there wouldn't be this marathon news conference at the end of the year. They have, however, uh, sprinkled a snippet of the fact that Putin and President Xi of China will be holding talks towards the end of the year, discussing the events of 2022. Uh, what, what one wouldn't give to be a fly on the wall in that conversation? I imagine it'll be pretty tense, um, given what we've previously seen of dialogues between the two or uh, remarks made by both administrations, particularly China, as a consequence of the actions this year. But I think it has to be said that there are opportunities for China over weakened Russia, as we've talked about in the podcast um, for many weeks now. Um, uh, if Russia becomes essentially a vassal state of China, it will be enormous concern for the West. But domestically, for China, it offers a lot of opportunities on the energy front and also geopolitically too. So that is why the dialogue is taking place. Uh, I think almost certainly there are opportunities for both sides here. And as we've spoken about at length, there's there's a very close relationship between the two for, for obvious reasons of their political systems and relative isolation on certain issues um, that are taking place around the world at the moment. So naturally, they are allies, despite the very, very embarrassing consequences internationally for China of being associated with Putin's regime. But nonetheless, they are a meeting which, as I say, I think will be a concern for some Western commentators because they'll say, well, there was a time where they wouldn't be pitched in the same room together. But here we are. They are now. So that's the, the latest in the political, diplomatic and energy spheres. Thank you for that, Francis. Before we move on to Colin, our guest, I would like to go back to you, Dom. I understand there have been some reports on Russians using 40-year-old shells on the battlefront. Can you tell us about these updates in more detail and what do they mean about the state of Russian weaponry? Yeah, sure. Well, I can't say a huge amount because it came from a senior unnamed US military official uh, last night talking about how Russia is having to use, in some cases, decades old old ammunition because it's, it's just gone through, it's burned through its stockpiles. Um, it does have a huge amount of, of weaponry, as we've seen, but a lot of it is very, very old. So as we've seen, T-62 tanks brought out of literally in some cases museums other cases uh, very very old uh, storage and and not not protected from the elements so we've seen t very old t62 tanks which you know it, not exactly but as the name suggests is around the 1960s vintage um depending on the on the variant but hey they're really old uh, really old tanks same same with ammunition so decades old ammunition ammunition it it, it it depends how you store it, depends how you make it in the first place, depends what the shell cases are made from. But, you know, they can have a high failure rate if you don't look after these things. So I actually, uh, for a story that we're going we're gonna to do over um, over the Christmas period, I went up to, uh, to the BAE Systems plant in Washington. Not that one, the one in the northeast of England, unfortunately, um, although it's very nice. Anyone listening to Washington, northeast England? Lovely. Um, a bit rainy. Uh, and that's where BAE systems make all the artillery ammunition, tank ammunition, mortars, load of other other bits and pieces to actually see how artillery shells are made. Uh, literally from a from a block of 
of metal that is heated up to 1200 degrees centigrade and then sort of squudged with this big plunger to make the shape of an artillery shell and then down the process and so on and so on and so forth fill it with explosives and off you go so i saw how these things were made and the care taken here to through all stages of the of the manufacturing process because of course every single shell has to be exactly the same it has to be the same weight if it's too heavy it won't have the range that it says on the on the tin not these things particularly come in tins but you know it's going to drop short which is not what you want if they're too light if there's too little um, metal in there it will go further than you expect so you, you know, when you're firing these things you want you want them to, you want to have a rough idea where they're going to go so they have to be exactly the same weight they have to be exactly the same shape so that they come out the barrel correctly. Um, they uh, they have to be. There can be no cracks or defects in the metal. Anything anything that's uh, faulty at that stage of the manufacturing process, when you fill it with high explosive and press go, the thing is going to there's going to be a massive explosion in in the breech of the gun, and you hope the gun is is able to all the effort um, goes to pushing that shell out of the gun. And uh, you know, chucking it 10, 12, 50k, whatever, downrange to uh, to the enemy. So you, what you don't want to happen is for that shell to fracture, and for all the high explosive that you want to arrive at your uh, at your enemy's location to go off in the in the breach of the gun, which will which will have catastrophic consequences for the for the crew. So I saw the um, the, the plant workers, you know, physically they check three in every thirty. Uh, shell cases that come out the forge and they, they check you know with x-rays and all sorts i mean it's amazing stuff what they what they do up there and then all through the process it's yeah you know, check and check and check again as these things are made so anything that's that's decades old is, is pro- the processes probably weren't as good back then um and also they might not have worn so well these, these things have got to be resistant to environmental conditions um from the outside of the shell you don't want it corroding you don't want anything happening on the inside of the shell for all the reasons i've i've just said so the more the older the ammunition generally um, i mean it's like you know it's like anything food and etc etc they literally have a shelf life you need to use these things up and if they get towards the end then you you send them down the um down the training range and, and blat them off so that they you know get some use out of them so these these shells that, that russia is uh, having to turn to it just it just speaks of what little how little they have left in the in the locker and um, there will be a much high higher failure rate they will not go where russia want them to go all the time and uh, and they could as i say have catastrophic consequences for the gun crews so the, the, the uh, u.s official spoke um anonymously he said quote um, they've drawn from russia's aging ammunition stockpile which does not indicate that they are willing to use uh well sorry which does indicate they're willing to use older ammunition some of which was originally produced more than 40 years ago now as something that was produced more than 40 years ago i'm not saying that is a, a bar to good quality but when it comes to ammunition it, it probably is so it, it just speaks of yet more um degradation of russia's war machine if they're having to turn to really old stuff then there's all the the chances of something going wrong at some at some uh, process through the firing mechanism from lifting the ammunition out of the out of the stock putting it in the in the gun and you know getting it down to the enemy you know, something's going to happen the, or the, the chances of something happening uh, throughout that process to make sure that or to mean that the the round doesn't land where intended those those risks are higher so turning to old ammunition not always a good idea but it speaks of um, some a little bit of desperation we know that they're trying to turn to North Korea for for newer ammunition supplies um, but you know none of this paints a good picture for the for the um, military production uh, and and that sort of provision of, of fresh modern safe reliable material that uh, that you really need to affect war thanks for that dom really fascinating insight into the uh, production and care taken in the manufacture of these weapons now as i mentioned at the top of the episode colin freeman and roland oliphant will join us this afternoon to discuss some of the year's best reading material on the background of the war Thank you both so much for joining us. Colin, if I could go to you first, if our audience reads one good book uh, to give some more context to this conflict, what would it be? Hello. Let me preface what I'm about to say uh, by just pointing out to readers that unlike Roland and Natalia, our regular podcast um, uh, contributors, I am not a Russian or Ukrainian expert. What I do do, though, is review books for The Telegraph's book pages so um, I am used to uh, reading books with, with, on subjects that I don't know necessarily know an awful lot about, with a view to working out whether they're you know a good a good a good read for folk who want to mug up on the subject as opposed to folk who might already be expert on it. And um, certainly, when it comes to the Ukraine conflict, um, 
I sort of think, well, uh, if there was a book that would be ideal for me, what would it have? It would have um, a detailed account of the conflict. It would have some explanation of the context and the historical background. And it would also be um, accessibly and easily written. Um, and also, more importantly, it might be out in time for Christmas, which, if you're an author, is a pretty, um, uh, a, a, a pretty big ask. However, Owen Matthews, who we had on the podcast recently, actually, um, he used to be a journalist for Newsweek, the American news magazine. He now writes very regularly for The Spectator. He has produced um, pretty much just such a book, actually, um, in just six months, well, just nine months into the conflict. It's called Overreach. And um, it's basically an account of the war from start to finish. Um, uh I, I was very, very impressed by it indeed. I mean, to, to do a book of this sort, um, it, it, w w given the deadlines he's been facing, is pretty impressive. But he manages to get pretty much everywhere. Um, uh, as I said in the review that I did for it, it, it he's a bit like a kind of all-seeing, all-hovering drone. We drop in everywhere. We, we, he takes us, you know, he recreates scenes, you know, in, in the Kremlin where Putin is sat at his white, long white table where we nip into Zelensky's bunker, we cover the siege of Kiev, where in Moscow, when the war breaks out, he actually was living there at the time. Um, we cover the trenches in Mariupol, in Mariupol long before the war even starts. It, it's got a bit of everything. Um, not all of it is firsthand, I should, uh, I should point out, but um, it would be impossible for any reporter to be you know, everywhere. Um, but what he does rather sensibly is, is take certain um, uh, snapshots and recreate them with very detailed testimonies using, for example, the, um, the war crimes hearing that took place um, in relation to some Russian soldiers who were arrested um, on suspicion of murder up in uh, in Israel earlier in the war, which gives him um, a lot more granular detail to mine into. Um, normally, if you're actually out covering anywhere on the front lines, um, you, you only get snatches of conversation because, not surprisingly, people have got um, better things to be worrying about at that point. Um uh, what, where the book is also very good, though, is um, he, he, he's, he's, he has a lot of coverage from Russia and how the Russians see the war. Um, and the, the, there's some quite touching um, comments from various people in his social circle in Moscow. Um, for example, um, some of them, uh, you know, there's, there's oligarchs who just take a very resigned view to the thing, opening their last cases of decent claret realizing this might be the last nice imported wine that they'll ever have and saying, right, you know, here we go again. It has ever been thus here in Russia that we, you know, uncertainty has been the way of things. Others get very patriotic, slightly chill in their relations to him. And then others just, to, you know, drown their sorrows um, saying, look, we don't want to stay here really. Uh, but unlike Ukrainians, if we go abroad and seek seek sanctuary elsewhere, we're not welcome. We're not we're, we're hated everywhere now. So it's it, you get you get you get you get a very good impression of what's happening in Russia there as well, which I think in this conflict thus far is is perhaps the more underreported of the two sides. Um, uh, I, I, the, I, I would say, to be honest, that this, this is probably certainly the, the best book that I have read in, 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 a, in, a, in a year of reviewing Ukrainian and Russian books. It's not a particularly uplifting one, though. You may want to you know, curl up with this one in front of your uh, Christmas armchair um, in, in the weeks to come. But uh, the, the conclusion, of, the, its conclusions about where Russia is going are not very encouraging. He, he says that, uh, paraphrasing slightly, but the, the, the phrase he uses is that Russia still unfortunately suffers an addiction to imperial fantasies and that the, 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 the urge to dominate um, these, these old territories and its empire are not going to go away uh, any time soon, he fears, and that if anything, um, the risk is that uh, uh, you know other hardliners may take over from Putin. There is not a cuddly liberal waiting in the wings. Thanks for that, Colin. Sounds really fascinating. 
As for books that we should be reading about Putin, particularly his life in detail and uh, Russian history more generally, do you have any recommendations you can share? Uh, on- yes, there's um, another one. Um, if you want the, the whole thousand years of Russian history, um, Roderick Braithwaite, who was the former a former British ambassador to the uh, to Moscow in the 1970s, but has, has since become a, a writer and author, well known for his recent book um, on the Afghan, the Soviet role in the Afghan conflict in the 1980s, called Afghansi. Um, he's produced a book called Russia: Myths and Realities, in which again he achieves the not inconsiderable feat of covering a thousand years of Russian history in just 250 pages. And it, in, it includes a lot about the czars, but it also includes the, the Soviet period and then its collapse. Where, where he was there during parts of that, if I remember rightly. Um, it's it, it's perhaps this one a bit more of a book for the history buffs compared to Owen's book, Owen Matthews' book, the one I was talking about earlier. But again, very easy to read. And um, in, in terms of some of the, the myths, he, he talks, for example, about what, what's sometimes known in Russia as the Mongol yoke. Uh, which is a reference to the fact that large parts of Russia and Ukraine, um, uh, you know, were, were invaded by the, the descendants of Genghis Khan back in the Middle Ages. This is sometimes used by some commentators and is, as an excuse for the, the sort of authoritarianism and the brutality that um, we often associate with, with successive inhabitants of the Kremlin. Um, he, he points out, actually, that, you know, most, if you go back a couple of hundred years, most countries were pretty brutal, their rulers, um, and Russia was no exception. He does seem to suggest, though, that in order to build, to, to control the country as large as Russia, you needed to run it with a very, very whip hand, or certainly that seems to be the lesson that um, successive rulers took. And the, the way he writes this book, you do get the impression, unfortunately, that... Um, Putin sees himself largely in the same vein as Catherine the Great, Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible, all these pretty tough rulers. And that the period of democracy in Russia in the early 1990s, where people laid off that kind of thing, was perhaps the exception rather than the rule. Just finally, um, I won't talk about this one long. If you want a slightly more readable, but, you know, just a, a, again, a, a kind of cosy curl up. Um, kind of read um, on um, Ukraine. Borderlands is very good. Um, uh, this is a book written by Anna Rida, a former Telegraph journalist who was in Ukraine in the 1990s, um, actually worked as the um, Telegraph correspondent, um, m- much more delving into the, the, the sort of social side of life, the history and everything else, and, and very much a kind of cosy uh, Waterston's two for one type read, if you know what I mean, one, one that you could quite happily settle down with and just read purely for enjoyment. Thanks, Colin. Really fascinating hearing from you as a book reviewer. Roland, if I can bring you in here as someone with more of an expert background, what would you recommend that we're reading if we want to learn more about the context of this invasion? Um, <laughs> never call a journalist an expert. We have to be experts in everything. <laughs> um, um, uh, well, to start off with, actually, um, Colin kind of took the words out of my mouth. I think if you are, if you're new to Ukraine and if you want um, an English language introduction to what this country is, where it is, I, I don't really think you can do better than Anna Reid's Borderland. It is, it is in that kind of uh, style of, of of a book written by a journalist. It's kind of first person. It's kind of a, um, you know, an anthology in a way of her her reporting trips around Ukraine in the early 90s or in the 1990s. Um, I'm not actually entirely sure which part of the 90s, but yeah, it, it's kind of steeped in, in in discovering this country that's emerged from the former Soviet Union, what it is, what's going on. And it touches every part of the country. Um, if you're an expert in Ukraine, you'll read it and you'll go, yes, well, okay, I know that, I know that. But but honestly, if, if, if you want a, a journalistic introduction into this country, what it is, what's going on, um, I, I highly recommend it. It's very sympathetic. Um, it's got lovely, lovely vignettes. It goes from, you know, from Donbass and the coal mines, you know, all, all the way west. Um, and and there is a that there has been an updated version um, brought out. There was certainly an updated version brought out following the 2014 war. Um, not sure if they've redone it um, since uh, since this war began in in February. Um, but definitely, um, 
Anna Reed for that for 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 a slightly more um, more kind of orthodox history. If you know what I mean, you 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 will have to make a little bit more effort to kind of keep turning the pages, um, or you'll just have to be a bit of a history buff. Um, is the uh, the Gates of Europe by Serhii Plohi. Um, you'll see this show up on, um, you know, a lot of lists of books you should read about Ukraine. Um, basically, because that there have not been written as many English language histories of Ukraine as there have of Russia. Uh, for Russia, you can take your pick. Um, uh, for this one, probably at the moment, the go-to work um, for, okay, um, this is Ukraine. How did it appear? Um, how did it get to the point where it is from the earliest times? Um, to the present, Sergei Plohi, The Gates of Europe. If you want to know, you know about the the baptism of Rus, um, who was Bogdan Meltsky, um, all these kinds of things, um, which bring us to today. Uh, that is the that's the your your go to work um, on the on the war. Oh, I've just been sitting here making this list. Um, do stop me if I'm going on. There, there, there's so much great stuff. Um, I, I'm just picking out a few things that I've come across. So, so first of all, there is um, a, an academic book about the war, um, the, the first war, which I find very interesting. Um, is It's called In Times of Trouble. It's by an academic at King's College London called uh, Anna Matveeva. Now, um, what I find interesting about this book is that it is – it's it's quite early on. It it's came out kind of around 2016, um, and it was looking at the insurgency in Donbass um, through the eyes of exclusively through the eyes of the local militants who joined the pro-Russian cause and the and the Russian volunteers who came down. Um, now I, there there will be people who say, okay, you're kind of setting aside. Oh, sorry, Roland, we seem to have uh, lost you there. For the time being, I'll go over to, well, I've learned not to call any journalist an expert. That's my lesson for the day. Uh, Our resident history buff, Francis Dernley, what would you recommend our audience uh, listens to? (laughs) Well, I'll echo what Roland was saying about the gates of Europe. That, I would agree, is the standard text for the history of Ukraine, which uh, I would recommend that people read. Of course, many will be familiar with Timothy Snyder's work, Yale professor. He's got a book out on Tyranny and on Ukraine, Lessons from Russia's War. That's also uh, highly recommended. I've not actually had a chance to read all of that yet. So uh, that one, I say I haven't actually read myself, but I just mention it because it's being talked about a lot at the moment. Other books I'd recommend that actually haven't come out this year, but I think offer a lot of insights on perhaps the broader canvas of strategy, history, politics in relation to Ukraine and Russia are as followed. I highly recommend a book that came out a few years ago when I was at university called Dark Continent, Europe's 20th Century by by, uh, Mark Mazower. This book essentially argues very persuasively, I think, that the way we conceptualize the 20th century is misleading. We see it in many ways as an inevitable triumph of democracy over autocracy. That important word inevitable there. And actually what this book really underlines is how fragile democracy was in the 20th century, particularly in the 1930s, and how whilst today, of course, almost every country in Europe is a democracy, That was not the case in that era. It was actually quite the reverse. The majority were, if not already dictatorships, were heading down that path. And I think it just emphasizes the fragility of Europe and a key word there about what is being, you know, what is at stake in this war, I believe. So I'd recommend that just for contextualizing European history. Another in this regard around democracy and particularly, he's particularly good on analyzing the the, uh, political differences in a philosophical and sociological sense between democracies and autocracy is Professor Professor David Runciman, somebody I used to work with at Cambridge, uh, The Confidence Trap, A History of Democracy in Crisis from World War I to the Present. As I say, he goes through the history of the 20th century, but also really looks at it from a more academic standpoint as to why democracies usually triumph over autocracies, but why and certain autocracies have had advantages strategically at at certain points, which I think is relevant for when talking about perhaps the conception or or, or how the the perception, should I say, the perception 
uh, why at certain points uh, dictatorships can be persuasive and indeed can have certain advantages in military contexts in the short term, if not the long term. Uh, in terms of, uh, again, broad brush stuff, post-war, A History of Europe Since 1945 by Tony Yut, a book I've talked about many, many times, particularly with relevance of the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think his insights on that are unparalleled, frankly, as to why the Soviet Union collapsed and the events that precipitated it, both within the Eastern European context, but also particularly within Russia itself. And I think valuable lessons there for, or for how regime change occurs in Russia and the dangers uh, relevant in that. Um, just talking on Russia as well, of course, the classic text, I would argue, on the Russian Revolution is uh, A People's Tragedy by Orlando Figes. Absolutely impeccable book, masterfully written and insightful on, I think the central thrust is of, of how small groups of individuals with an extremist bent have essentially distorted Russia to their will in the 20th century and that there were moments when history could have been very different, but it wasn't because of the zealots, of course, particularly in the context of the events described, which is 1891 to 1924, is the Russian Revolution and the uh, Bolsheviks, but it has broader implications about what Roland was talking about there, which is this sort of um, uh, implications of how the Russian people themselves have been impacted by what the events that have taken place. And just uh, the last the last recommendation I have is a bit of a, more of a, uh, an unusual one. And I don't think it's very widely read at all, but it's an obscure book that I read at uh, university, which really, really stuck with me. It's called Orderly and Humane, The Expulsion of Germany, Germans After the Second World War by R.M. Douglas. Why do I mention this? Well, this essentially talks about what happens when governments, and in this case, it's talking about Western governments, um, try and forcefully move population around ethnic groups within countries. And I mention this because this is now being talked about as something which, of course, is already happening from the Russians doing it in Ukraine. But also there's talk about how this might be something that has to happen at the end of the war, that Russians who are currently in Ukraine will be moved back to Russia, etc. And I just mention this book because it talks about the real life consequences of that. Hundreds of thousands of people died when this happened at the end of the Second World War. It's a totally forgotten event, I would argue, in European history, at least as far as the broad brush approach to, the, to that century is taken. And I just recommend it to flag the real life consequences of trying to actually move hundreds of thousands of people in a short time span. It is not easy, easily done, and it comes with huge moral consequences, which is why I mention it. And the last thing I just wanted to say is actually a request, a request for publishers or a request if this book already exists. But one of the best books I read in recent years uh, in terms of providing an anthology of literature, of primary texts, of historical documents, is a book on the Czech, uh, on the Czech Republic called a Czech, The Czech Reader, History, Culture, Politics. And it basically lists 150 primary texts, as I say, that covers the creation of Czechoslovakia in 1918 to uh, the creation of the Czech Republic in 1993. Now, as far as I know, no equivalent of this book exists about Ukraine in English. So this is a request, as I say, to, if it does already exist, please let me know because I would absolutely love to read it. But if it doesn't exist, it's a polite recommendation to publishers who may be listening to this to, to ask somebody to write it because, or edit it, should I say, because as I, say, I think it's the best book, at least that I've read on the history of Czechoslovakia and its history. And if there was an equivalent for Ukraine, I think it would be absolutely invaluable for scholars reading up on the country of Ukraine. So those are my uh, recommendations, but also a request there at the end for anyone who might be able to help me out. Thanks, Francis. And please do get in touch via Twitter or email if you're able to help Francis out on his request. Colin, kind of honing in a bit more specifically, we've talked about broader context of the of the war and, and where we can find context and reading material on that. I understand you have some recommendations on specifically life in the Donbass region, where we've seen much fighting over the course of this conflict. What would you recommend people read around that Yes, uh, this is a book called In, I In Isolation by a journalist called Stanislav Aseyev. Um, and he spent two and a half years uh, in a um, separatist run jail in the Donbass region. That, of course, is the region that's been under separatist pro-Russian control since 2014. 
Um, uh, it, it, it's it's a bit of a niche read, but I am kind of assuming that people who are still tuning into this podcast this far into the war are probably pretty interested in um, in, in these kind of things, in what's going on in places like the Donbass. And uh, it, unlike me, they may also be curious about just what it is that makes people in that region different from the rest of Ukraine, why they're so keen to be part of um, uh, the part part of Russia or have closer links to the Kremlin, if that is indeed the case. Uh, and because as, as a lot of us know, it, it seems to be far more than just about whether you speak Russian or not. Um, so anyway, th- this um, this particular journalist, Stanislav Asayev, he, uh, he th- this account is is not actually of his time in prison. That's the subject of a separate book that he did. But he does it, it's an account of everyday life, really. And it's it's pretty grim. He, he describes the um, the Donetsk People's Republic as being run basically by a, a combination of opportunist gangsters um, petty thugs, criminals, and lots of different competing militias um, who, often, who spend as much time fighting each other as anyone else. He says that there are killings either due to shelling from the Ukrainian side or just um, inter gang rivalry almost every day. Um, and he, he also describes, um, you know, seeing people just getting shot during gang disputes and stuff. And yet, um, you, you would think on that basis that this was a place where everybody was living under the, the jackboot of some very small, tyrannical group. But he actually says that um, the, the a lot of the people there are quite supportive of the DPR. Um, and the, the reason why, I mean, the reason for this are many, but one of the things he points out is that this is a, a very sort of, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's an old Soviet coal and steel mining area, very traditional industrial area, breeding a kind of person of a certain sort. What, what he really describes is a kind of classic Soviet man, really, um, uh, a, a kind of you know, orthodox proletariat, I think is his phrase, hard drinking, hard working, and as he says, not particularly interested in civil liberties. And for these kind of people, he says that the Soviet Union reminds them of, you know, happy childhoods in the 1970s with, you know, warm May Day rallies and so on. And for them, when Ukraine started moving westwards into the considering EU membership, all that looked at like was kind of Western economic liberalism coming along. and, And that just posed uncertainty not opportunity. And for them, that draw of the Soviet Union, which the separatists have played on a lot, is a it is quite a powerful one. Um, and uh, th- th- that's kind of the, the, the stab he has at trying to analyze what is going on. Or rather, that's my my stab at it in terms of what I've read of, of his book. Um, uh, but w- what you also realize from this is that if, if what he says is correct, then it's unlikely that life in the Don in the Donbass regions and the separatist regions is going to change back to being pro-Ukrainian or, or even sort of basically very peaceful overnight. It, he he paints a picture of a place that's been pretty traumatized, mines turned pretty poisonous in many ways. It's very hard to really see how Ukraine can, if they do retake that territory how they will be able to pacify it and get it back to normal um, without a great deal of difficulty. Thank you for that, Colin. We're coming to the end of our time this afternoon, so I'd like to go to everybody's final thoughts. Dom, if I can come to you first for any final thoughts, or I feel rude not asking, any book recommendations you might also have for our audience? Oh, thanks, Claire. I won't wade into the book the book debate. I think the guys have uh, covered that very very well. Anything I offer uh, would not would not be able to uh, would not be able to um, match up to that. I suggest. But uh, I'm currently reading Butler to the World, which I think is very good, explaining many re- reasons why uh, Londonistan is now London grad, or trying to get get away from uh, London London grad and Prisoners of Geography. Obviously, by Tim Marshall, because that that's uh, really good uh, really good for explaining uh, much about the world. But my final thought would be. I mean, well, on that last point, maybe look at look at the geography. The geography of the of this of this war at the moment lends itself to um, 
possibly that push down into the into the central area as we uh, as we saw with this bridge strike and i think there'll be some more of these types of activities these shaping activities as we get into the hard uh, the, the hard bite of of winter so just to, to keep an eye out for for more action um, that might not necessarily seem all linked together at the first uh, first blush but um action in the deep looking to cut russian resupply lines for any any potential push down to the coast around that melitopol mariupol area thanks for that dom over to you colin what would you like to leave our uh, listeners with I, I i will listen leave them with yet another observation from a book because i've had my nose buried in books much of this week um uh, which is Mark Galliotti's book, um, Putin's Wars. Uh, it's a big uh, investigation and detailed account, sometimes a little too detailed in my opinion, but if you're a war buff, you'll enjoy it, um, of Putin's, um, uh, how Putin has run the military over time. Um, I'll, 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 I'll leave you one interesting observation, which is that he makes it fairly clear that the, the, the Russian military is is not like the old Red Army. It is not capable of overrunning Europe. It relies very much on railways to, for resupplies and so on. And it, it has that fundamentally limits what it can do, not least because the railways in Europe run on different railway lines from the, the rail gauges in the Ukraine and so on. So it, when I read that, it did give me a little bit of pause for thought in terms of where we when we hear so often this talk of Russia invading Poland and then you know the rest of Eastern Europe and who knows they'll soon be knocking at our doors. Um, I think certainly while they might have the the nuclear reach to do that, the idea that they would have the manpower reach to do it uh, seems somewhat in question. But that, that's my final thought anyway. Thank you, Colin. Really fascinating. Uh, Francis, finally over to you. Thanks, Claire. Well, we've talked about literature today and there's something positive Orwellian about this one, which is that a Russian blogger has been fined for discrediting the Russian military after describing a, a vivid dream he had about Vladimir Zelensky. So uh, this man, a 26 year old from Eastern Russia, was unaware of the fact that an Instagram social media post that he made was monitored by officers from the FSB. And as a consequence of this dream that he described in the post, which saw him meeting Zelensky and Zelensky saying, uh, you know, let this one go after being captured, after being mobilized um, in the dream. Uh, he has now faced a fine of 30,000 rubles, which I think comes to around 390 pounds, if my maths is correct. Um, after a local court convicted him of being in breach of the law that cracks down on dissent against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As you can imagine, this poor 26-year-old was rather aghast to uh, receive this news. He said it was idiocy, but nonetheless, he has been fined, as I say. And, I mean, if there's any story that's indicative of what's going on in Russia at the moment in an attempt to stamp out dissent, then I think it's this one. Just truly, truly absurd. But then... There's ne absurdity and tyranny are never, never um, far apart. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings you stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. We're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Jaden Irving. <laughs>